So, we are continuing our series, Love Is. Tonight, something that I realized is as we continue this series, it's good that if we all had an agreeable definition of what love is, right? Tonight, it, we're going to try to do something that a lot of people have attempted to do in their lives. A lot of books, like books and movies, The Notebook, are like, this is what love is, this is what love is, la, 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 la. Look, they're inseparable, and they make out in the rain, and they're in love, okay? Today, we're going to mess with that a little bit, and we are going to find out the original intention of love. I mean, think of that concept. So, like I was saying it even in the prayer, like God stands at the, at the, the beginning of time, before anything's created, and he thinks about love as an attribute. He thinks about what it's going to be and what it's going to look like and everything else like that. And so it's foolish for us to try to redefine or fit into our context, because that's what we do with everything, Right? We want to take something and make it look like a 21st century high schooler and then what would it look like with us. Instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to what maybe he originally planned for it. Okay? You need your Bibles. 1 Corinthians. If you don't have your Bibles, uh, Joshua team will grab those Bibles in the back. Just raise your hand. They will deliver it to your seats. If that's not service with a smile, I don't know what is. Okay? They'll bring it right to you. You're going to need them. We're note takers here in 1112. If you need to take notes on your iPod, iPad, electronic device, whatever it might be, margins of your Bible, notes, get them out. We're going to be taking notes, especially for tonight, because you'll have to refer back to this talk for the rest of our series. Because when I say love, you'll have to know the working definition that we're going to have for this, okay? So, here's, what, here's the process that we have. God is in the Garden of Eden, right? Garden of Eden is a place where he makes men and women. If you guys don't know, 1 Corinthians 13, it's towards the back of your Bibles. Okay, there's the, it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, New Twisted Testament's toward the back of your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A lot of people are just entitled love. That's the headline of it or whatever. My Bible is on page 2083. That's not helpful for anybody else. Every time. No one. All right. So here we go. God is standing in the Garden of Eden. Okay, now that right there should just blow your minds. Okay, God takes a physical form, and it says he walks with them in the garden. All right, so God's just walking. Why he chooses to walk instead of float? Because he wants to relate to people. So he walks everywhere he goes. Okay, our God is a boss. You just got to understand that. Okay, so God's walking in the garden, and he's like, you know what would be great is um, if we had people. People would be great. So he creates whales and sharks and uh dogs and satan makes cats and so he's like now populated the world okay trees figs uh sand water air space oxygen time he has spoken it all into being and then in order to just really show off he goes i'm going to make someone in our image even in the hebrew it's plural okay he says now let us make man in our image who's the our Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, three in one. That's for a whole other topic. Right now, we're going to go with the word God. So God makes man. And here's something cool with guys. Here's something you need to understand. If you guys want to turn really quick, it's easy to find. Put something in that part of your Bible. Go back to Genesis. This is something I just realized not too long ago. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Um, every time I've seen this depicted in movies or TV shows or anything else like that, here's what I see. There's like this garden, right, Garden of Eden. It's lush with waterfalls and flowers everywhere. And then God goes down into like the rich soil of the garden, of the flowery garden. And he's like, I'm going to make men. And he like picks up dirt. And then he like breathes into it and it becomes a living thing. Okay, get, get this. Watch this. Genesis chapter 2. By the seventh day, God had finished his work and he decided he was going to take a nap. Okay? And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on, he rested from all, all the work of creating that he had done. Why? Because God gets tired? No. He's setting an example for us. Because some people want to work seven days a week and refuse their families. Some of you have dads like this. Okay? This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God did not send rain into the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the water and watered the whole surface. You don't need to know this part. That's why I'm reading it quickly. The Lord God formed the man. Here we go. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Here's the part I never saw before. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and then he put the man there, which he had formed. Okay, so men, where are we created? In the wilderness, right? In the outback. 
in the barren, desert, manly, don't bring your children here, out back. God takes up dirt and he breathes, okay? The, the word that he breathes into us is ruach, okay? It's this Hebrew word. It means the breath of life. God breathes and he gives animas. He gives characteristics. He gives character, movement, thought, consciousness to this piece of dirt and it becomes man. And then he goes, man, now that you've experienced the outback, I'm going to show you somewhere I want you to tend. And he puts him in the garden where then he makes woman, okay? So men are made out of dirt. Women are made out of ribs, okay? <laughs> We're like hardcore. You're like, a rib, yay, okay? <laughs> Important to know that. But that spirit that he originally breathed into us, that ruach, it has been tainted over the years. How do we know? Because the original ruach that we were given, the original breath, it says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, God breathed originally into us men and into us women a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And if you look around in the world, I think one of the last three words you would use for the way that guys and girls interact with one another is with love, in power, and in self-discipline. Am I right? So let's get back to where we went wrong. 1 Corinthians 13. Here we go. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. And I'm just going to do it so you don't all think about it the whole time when I say what is love. Okay? You can now get that out of your brains. Okay, here we go. Beginning at verse 8. Last week we said, we said that love, one of the great attributes of love is that it does what? Perseveres. It means no matter what, we're sticking this thing out. That is what love says. Even from the beginning of time, God says, no matter what happens, no matter what comes between the two of us, I'm going to redeem you and take you back. Okay? Beginning at verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. After perseveres, it says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. So basically this whole next section says, if you're smart, if you think you're wise, you know a lot about the Bible, it's all going to go away. Okay? And now here's what we're getting to. Verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child, but then I became a man and I put my childish ways behind me. Now that is smack dab in the middle of the love chapter of the Bible. So Paul right here is making a distinction, that there's a distinction between the way that children think about love and the way that men think about love. The way that little girls think about love and the way that women think about love. We are going to discover that. Okay? This is an important thing too. At the very end of that chapter it says, verse 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I was thinking, why is that the greatest? It's the only thing that carries on from this life to the next. It's the only one of those that carries on. Faith. Faith will be made complete, right? We don't need faith in heaven, right? He's right there. It's like, believe in me. It's like, okay. <laughs> like if I held a chair and I was like, believe in the chair, you'd be like, I see the chair. Don't need to believe in it, okay? Hope. Hope is manifested in death, right? For Christians, when we die, our hope is manifested and we're made alive again, right? So that passes away. But guess what will remain? In this life and the next, one thing is going to remain, and that is love. One thing remains. His love never fails. Never gives up. Never gives up. Okay. Anyway. Working definition of love. You're going to want to write this down. This is it. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? There's a man who studied about 25,000 psychiatric cases, psychological cases, top of his field, wrote a best-selling novel that spent seven years at the top, the top of the New York Times best-selling list. Along with that, I did research that expanded hundreds of other authors who have tried and attempted to come up with one working definition of love. And if you took all of those definitions and you put them in a pot and you boiled it, and you had just found what rose to the surface, and you scraped it off, and you said, what if we took all those definitions of love, found the ones that worked, put them in a pot, and then what would come to the surface? That is the definition of love you're going to get today. Okay? It's going to be a mouthful. It's going to be a brainful. But then again, we have a lot of weeks to figure this crap out. Okay? Love is an act of the will, first and foremost. Love is an act of the will. Act of the will. What does that mean? Love is on purpose. Love does things intentionally. If you passively love someone, you don't really love them. You can't. It's an act of the will. If love for you with someone is always easy and never difficult 
and never requires you to grow or learn or anything else like that, it better be Jesus calling. Perfect, it was. Okay, good. He's all, I had a question about the love thing. <laughs> what are you talking about? Okay, an act of the will. Love is an act of the will. Next part, parenthetical, accompanied by emotion. Okay, love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion. Okay, guys, accompanied by emotion. Ladies, accompanied by emotion. Ladies, not led by emotion. Okay, this is where we get it all twisted. This is where Nicholas Sparks gets everything all twisted. Okay, Nicholas Sparks sits in his little desk in his multi-million dollar house and goes, I am going to write a book about what makes women emotionally charged and it's called A Walk to Remember. A man sacrifices everything that he has for someone who is a hopeless case in the end. Does that sound like anything to you? It should, because it's the story of Jesus. Anyway, okay, so Nicholas Sparks, what he does in all of his books, he's like, well, what if they made out in the rain? That's better, okay? It's love, because he left his engagement to have sex with a man who's got a beard, and that makes sense, okay? It's <laughs> Noah and Ali, the notebook. You know what? You watch too many movies, okay? <laughs> Whatever. Everyone cheats on each other. That's my point. It's not really love. Act of the will, accompanied by emotion. Gentlemen, not void of emotion. Here's where, like, ladies, don't let guys get away with this. And guys, you're dumb if you say this. Some guys are like, I'm just not an emotional guy. Okay. I have played more sports in my life on high school teams, club teams, to know that you are an emotional man. Where you choose to exercise that is very different, but you are emotional, okay? You're telling me that if I played you in basketball and I'm beating you 23 to 1, you'd just be like, well, oh, we seem to be getting beaten soundly in the skirmish. <laughs> Hopefully we do better next time. No, you kick things, right? And you throw them, okay? And you yell explicit words. That is called an exhibition of emotion. That's emotion, okay? So you can't go, I'm not emotional. I mean, like, I hate basketball, okay? Those two things don't go hand in hand because anger, that's an emotion, okay? Accompanied by it, okay? If you hit a golf ball, if you've ever been golfing, you have emotions, and you're well aware of that now, okay? Because a freaking small, stupid ball goes whatever direction it wants to go, okay? If you slice it, like, 48 yards that direction, you're not going to be like, oh, well, I seem to have mishit that particular ball. <laughs> Seems to be in the ravine. <laughs> Hopefully I'll retrieve another one. Okay? Accompanied by emotion. Love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that acts on behalf of its object. An act of the will accompanied by emotion that acts on behalf of its object. Okay? That means the action that it does is for the object of its affection, okay, of its love. Act of the will, accompanied by emotion, that acts on behalf of its object for their spiritual growth. Act of the will, accompanied by emotion, that acts on behalf of its object for their spiritual growth. And then if you want to put this thing at the end, you can. And it says this, through judicious giving and withholding. Through judicious giving and withholding. A lot of big words. You're going to sound really smart when someone asks you that. A lot of people are going to be like, what is love? And everyone's going to be like, love is trees. Love is air. It's, it's, it's just feeling and hugs and kisses. And you're going to be like, well, actually love is an act of the will that uh, accompanied by emotion that acts on behalf of its object for its spiritual growth growth through judicious giving withholding. And they're going to be like, we shouldn't have asked you. We were looking for bumblebees, OK? Judicious giving withholding, what does that mean? Judicious, OK? What's the root word of judicious? Judge, judge right? Judge. You have to make a decision, OK? It's a process of making decisions. It's acting on behalf of its object through judicious giving and withholding. A loving parent does not say, whatever you want, I want to give it to you, right? We think that's loving. We even say that grandma must really love you because she gives you all the sugar you want. Okay? Grandma must really hate your future. Because when you're 45 and weigh 445, you're going to be like, grandma loved me, but I've got type 2, right? So, like, it's not beneficial. 
Love does not always give, nor does it always withhold. It's not whatever you want, and it's not never what you want. It's a judicious process. Okay? Act of the will, accompanied by emotion, acts on behalf of its object for their spiritual growth through judicious giving and withholding. If what you consider loving does not end in the spiritual growth of you or somebody else, it's not loving. What is spiritual growth? Let me tell you. As a Christian, what it means is if it does not make you, in the end, more like Christ, it's not loving. For the outside world, spiritual growth means your character, okay? Who you are when no one's looking, your integrity. Love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that acts on behalf of, the, of its object for their development of character. That's the outside world. We're going to say it has to move you closer to Christ, okay? That is our working definition of love. I have, to this day, not come across someone who has shown me a genuine example of love that does not fit into that context. Likewise, knowing that is really going to help you weed out a lot of people who think they're in a loving relationship. Right now, I'm going to give you six things all together. Three, three questions that the world asks about love that's actually not loving, and three questions that we should ask about love moving forward, okay? A lot of information for one night, I understand, okay? Right? Paul makes this dichotomy, the childish definition of love. There's a childish way of looking at love. He says, I used to look at love that way, but now I've grown up. A childish way of looking about love. The first question, what will your affection profit me? That's what self self ish, childish, immature love asks. Worldly love says, what do you profit me? Okay, again, 98% of movies that you see practice this kind of love, right? Even The Notebook, okay? And I know it's a great feature film. I understand that entirely, Oscar worthy, okay? But everyone in that show asks one question, what will your affection profit me? And when that runs out, they switch, right? Allie's all bent on Noah, and then Noah leaves, and what does she do? I don't really know where to go. Okay, and she goes and finds it somewhere else. It's not love. Okay, here we go. Moving on. Um, we use this word, it's unlovable. Here's what we mean by unlovable, just so you guys can really break it down. When something, someone is unlovable, it means that investing in them will not bring me more popularity, power, or wealth. That's what we consider someone unlovable. An unlovable person is someone who does not benefit me by giving me more power, popularity, or wealth. Okay? You guys have people that walk around your school and you're like, oh man, they're so unlovable. All you've just said is that they are neither more popular than you, more powerful than you, more wealthy than you. They have nothing to benefit you. That's when we consider someone unlovable. Okay? A selfish, worldly definition of love asks this question, what will your affection profit me? Number two, second question, what can I say and do to manipulate my desired response? Okay? What can I say and what can I do to manipulate my desired response? So, guys, girls, this is what we do. It's a very brief saying. And I understand that it's, it's like this uh, very overarching topic saying, but this is very true for a lot of us, right? Guys say, I love you to get sex, and girls use sex to say, I love you, right? And so both sides are really at this big disconnect. Because guys and girls are looking for two very different things while at the same time using the same medium. Does that make sense? Okay. This is a childish way of thinking. How can I manipulate you to get what I want? What can I say that makes you fall in line with what at the end of the day I want? It's a childish way of viewing love. Okay? Um, there's a saying that we're going to use all the time in here, and it's this. There's this thing called codependency. Okay? I would say 98%, 99% of high school relationships are, uh, it's actually not a relationship. It's not loving. It's called codependent. Okay, codependent. All right, you can look it up. It's a neurosis. Uh, you can look it up on Google and find out what codependency is, and you're going to look at it, and you're going to go, everyone I know in high school has this kind of a relationship. It's called codependency. What does that mean? It means you as a female have certain needs. You want to feel beautiful. You want to feel admired. You want to have a boyfriend. You want to, ah, 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 ah. 
Guys, you have your needs. You want a girl. You want to be able to tell your stories. You want to be able to have locker room talk. You want to exercise certain parts of your body, right? Guys have their desires. Girls have their desires. And they go, you know what? If we both just hung out more often and called it dating, I could satisfy your desires and you could satisfy my desires. That's called codependency, okay? It's nothing new with love. It's not about growth. It's about what can I get from you, okay? Here's the saying. Codependency. Codependency is hate that masquerades itself as affection. Codependency is hate that masquerades itself as affection. So if the end result of love is to create growth, then hate is something that mutes growth. Okay? Right? We think of hate. What do we think of? I slashed your tires. I kicked your grandma. Right? Those are hateful things. The most hateful thing that you can do according to scripture is prevent someone from growing. Okay? That's hate. Codependency is hate that masquerades itself as affection. The third question that childish love asks is this. At what point can I forfeit without appearing like a coward? Once I've gotten what I wanted, which is question number one, how can I forfeit this quote-unquote love without appearing like a coward or shallow? Okay? Right? And guys and girls, we become so good at this. Listen, look, it's not you, it's me. Um, it, God told me that this isn't going to work out between the two of us. Um, I really want to focus on school right now. Right? I mean, all these different things that we say. Uh, for the record, just if you just come into 11, 12, I will respect you zero if you walk up to me and be like, God told me to break up with them because it's false, okay? It's just false. If you mean you want to break up with them and it's for godly reasons, like you want to spend more time at church, I understand that. But I guarantee you, homeboy did not walk in your room and go, listen, uh, Chelsea, we need to talk. You know that boyfriend you have? Dump him. That's it. I'm out, right? <laughs> it's like not a guy that shows up and does that kind of thing. So God did not tell you to go break up with her. If he did, let's sit down and talk because I want to hear all about it. Okay? I'll bet it was a crazy experience for you. Probably like a lot of lights, bright night noises, all that kind of stuff. Okay? God did not tell you to break up with anyone. Capiche? Even if you think he did, don't tell me because what will happen to your respect level, it'll go like this. Okay? From me. Why? Because I have been a Christian my whole life. And God has never been like, hey, Chris, we need to talk. You just need to break up with them. Okay? I have heard people say, I got divorced because God told me to. So homeboy wrote a Bible 3,000 pages big saying divorce is the opposite of what I want. And then God's like, you know, uh, I really think you should break up. Not cool. Okay? That's the three questions. Now, as fast as can be, true love's real questions. First and foremost, do I know and receive love? You got to ask that question. Okay, here's something backwards. This is going to trip you out at the beginning. First and foremost, true love is selfish. Okay? Love, at its start, if it's real love, is selfish. At its core, it's selfish. Okay? What does that mean? Listen. If the process of stretching myself to have you grow spiritually causes me to stretch myself and grow spiritually. I can't love honestly without loving who else? Me. Paige is my wife. I cannot love her well without growing. I can't do it. 
Because loving means extending myself in every aspect in order to create spiritual growth in her. And if I'm constantly focused on that and I'm not taking this apathetic sideline view of a relationship with her, then I am constantly pushing myself beyond what I am comfortable with in order to grow her. And in turn, I'll have to have discussions that I don't want to have. I'll have to do things I don't want to do. I'll have to sacrifice things that I wouldn't otherwise sacrifice. And in doing so, I will experience spiritual growth. And if spiritual growth is the end result of love, then at its core, in order to love someone, I will always necessarily love me. A lot of people in this world do not love people because they do not love themselves. If you loved yourself, you would extend yourself for other people. You have to know how to receive love before you can give it. If you come from an incomplete and broken home and you have no clue who you are, do not try love with other people. You become you first. You learn who you are first and learn love and then give it a try when you're like 20 because it's going to take that long, okay? Second question, how do I encourage and challenge the subjects of my love? Okay? Working definition, love is an act of the will. So, you cannot ever take anyone seriously when they say, I love this person. And then you say, how do you love them? And you go, well, I just really, really like them. And that's love. Like People who are like, I love Kenyan youth. I love African babies so much. And you're like, really, how? Well, I watch them on the TV, and they just look like they really need help. So I love them. No, you don't. You feel bad for them. You feel empathy towards them. That's not love, okay? Love has to move before it can be called love. How do I encourage and challenge the subjects of my love? How do I encourage and challenge the subjects of my love? Okay, basically in your friendships, here's the real question you need to ask. Do I love you more or do I love me more? Okay? Because if I love me more, then I'm going to just milk out every last thing I can from you popularity, whatever you can give me, and then I'm going to throw you away. If my concern is you more and your growth, then no matter what crap we face, we're getting through it, okay? Last question. Does my love have the attributes of his love? Does my love carry with it the attributes of his love? We have such an advantage being in the church, and I'll tell you why. Because the man who invented love wrote a book for us on how to love people. All right? It's like if we bought a we and we were a big family, right? Probably from Utah. We we're just this big family. Okay? And we all bought a we. And the guy who invented we was part of our family. And then we go ask like Jedediah how to set it up. That would be stupid. Because this guy invented it. Okay? We have the advantage of living in a house, having a dad who invented it. We can go to him and be like, excuse me, what does love look like? He's going to tell us. Do, does my love look like his love? How do we know that? There's a chapter in the Bible called 1 Corinthians 13. Ask yourself, is my love patient? Is it kind? Does it envy? Does it boast? Is it proud? Is it rude? Does it seek self? Is it angered easily? Does it keep a record of wrongs? Does it delight in evil? Does it rejoice with the truth? Does it protect, trust, hope, persevere? Does it fail? Do I have a childish view of love? Do I value faith and hope greater than I do love? All those things are backwards. We have a great model. Let's Use it. He invented the we. Let's ask him how to use it. Okay? Hopefully you guys were listening earlier. This sounded super weird. Okay? Christians, this is what we do. We play duck, duck, goose with the parts of Christianity that we want, right? All the time. I do it. You do it. Here's what we do. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I don't do that. I don't do that. But I don't love people. Don't catch me. Okay? That's what we do, right? I don't do that, I don't do that. I swear all the time, right? We all have that thing that we pick. It's duck, duck, goose with Christianity. God says, this is what it means to follow me. And we go, I like it, I like it, mm. I like it, I like it. I like the forgiveness thing, but I don't like forgiving others things. So I'm gonna go ahead and receive it without giving it out, right? That's what we do. As if God's okay with it. He's like, oh, that's good. <laughs> Seven out of 10's not bad. Sweet deal. No. Okay? Here's something that you guys have to get. Never once in the Bible, not one time, once, one time, does Jesus call people Christians, okay? In fact, 
in the ancient Near East, in the first century, Christian was a derogative, derogatory term. Okay? It was a joke. It meant little Christ people. Okay, that's what Christian means. It means little versions of Jesus. It's a patronizing term. And we try to define ourselves by a word that we never use in the Bible. So we're allowed to make it look like however we want, right? I'm a Christian. What the frick is that? I don't know. The Bible doesn't even call us Christians. But if you call yourself a disciple, that's some scary crap right there because he tells us exactly how a disciple is supposed to live. And you want to know how a disciple is known more than any other thing in the Bible, more than what you don't do, more than what you refuse, more than what you reject. It says they will, they will know that you follow me, that you are my disciples based on the way that you love. They all know, they will know you are my disciples by your love. And we go, they'll know I'm a Christian because I don't party. I'm not exactly going to love people, cherish them, use, use love that is kind, patient. I'm going to envy, I'm going to boast all this thing, but I don't drink. As if God's going to be like, yeah, no. Because the whole point is to love. If you understand love, you're going to reject certain things because that's not a loving thing to do. If you go, just get wasted with your friends. There's no love in there, okay? Why? Because no one spiritually grows when you're naked on the lawn, right? And you don't know where you are. You don't wake up the next morning like, you know what I learned about myself last night? I am stupid, right? It's not helpful. What if we as Christians committed to being more known for what we do than what we refuse to do? We sit on our little high and mighty stools of, I don't do this, I don't do that, rah, 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 as if God's super concerned about that. What he's super concerned about is the fact that we don't love. What if we fix that? Love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that acts on behalf of its object for its spiritual growth. To start looking at it through that lens and start, start looking at it as a man and not a child. Okay? That is our working definition of love. We've done it in a very short period of time. That's what we're going to work on from here on out in these next few weeks, okay? I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to get out of here. For those of you who aren't going to the Delta next week, you will find out through Facebook this week who is going to be coming in and speaking with you guys. Um, but we will not, the rest of us will not be here next week because we will be living life on the Delts, okay? Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for being a God who encompasses himself in the simple idea of being loving. And the reason it's not simple anymore is because we have a hundred thousand people trying to tell us what it is instead of reverting back to the person who invented it. We're sorry for when we do that and when we mess it up. When we take more pride in what we don't do than what we do and who we love and how we love. May we love as an action. May we love in you because we have been loved by you. In your name we pray. Amen.